Kristen Soldis Anderson is a Republican strategist and pollster. She's a partner at Echelon Insights, a public opinion and analytics firm that helps companies and campaigns craft messages and strategies. She's also a contributor to The Daily Beast. And she's author of this new book, The Selfie Vote, Where Millennials Are Leading America and How the Republicans Can Keep Up. She joins me from New York. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for having me. The subtitle is uh, "Let's Where Millennials Are Leading America and How Republicans Can Keep Up. Okay, where are millennials leading? First, define millennials are what? Millennials are those who were born between the years of about 1980 and 1999. So kind of stretches from today's teenagers all the way up till folks that are in their mid-30s. Okay, and where are they leading us? Are they the future? Well, obviously they're the future. They are the future. So right now there are about 75 million millennials in the United States. And this is a generation that is, uh, you know, has grown up with uh, technology. The internet has just sort of been the norm. Um, the term used to be digital natives, but now that, that's sort of an outmoded term and millennials has become the term we use for the generation. And, I mean, where they're leading America is, is fascinating. The way they're living their lives is so different from the way their parents or grandparents did. The way they're building their families, the way they're building their careers, their homes, their personal finances, so much has changed in, in really a, a very short amount of time. Um, so my whole book, The Selfie Vote, is about helping Republicans and marketers and politicians, but particularly Republicans, figure out where is this generation going and how can they get back in touch um, with these folks that they've sort of lost in recent uh, elections. Are you a millennial? I am a millennial. I'm at the older edge of the millennial generation, but I am a millennial. You write that the millennial voters view the Republican Party as closed-minded, racist, rigid, and old-fashioned. Is that a correct view? I don't think it's a correct view, but I think that Republicans haven't done a good enough job trying to dispel that myth. Um, an analogy that I heard used recently that I, I thought was pretty accurate is, think about if you've got two friends that are fighting with each other and only one of them tells you their side of the story. You kind of tend to side with the friend that you hear from and, and you think worse of the other party. Democrats have made a real effort to talk to young voters and they've painted this picture of a GOP that is all of those things you just described. And Republicans are never really there talking to young people to provide a counter narrative. So things like, for instance, Todd Akin in the 2012 election, who you know said really unhelpful, horrible things about rape and pregnancy, all of a sudden that's the thing that young people are hearing and they think that's what Republicans all stand for when that couldn't be further from the truth. But if Republicans aren't talking to young voters at all, it allows the other side to define them in that way. And it means that young voters just sort of tune out when, when Republicans do want to show up and say something helpful. Did not Barack Obama use social media in both elections and even surprise people by the overwhelming vote he got in the millennial community? He did. So he's been one of the candidates who has just pioneered the, so much of the use of this, both for communicating and for organizing um, younger people yeah. uh, using the power of the Internet. And uh, not only that, but he's also been was somebody who used data to better target voters in ways that Republicans are only just now beginning to catch up on. Well, millennials, I gather in wide numbers, favored same sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Republicans, a lot of Republicans opposed it. Was that a mistake or was that a true belief that they were expressing? So I think most, many of these Republicans, particularly the ones running for president, did hold views about traditional marriage that were at odds with where a lot of millennials are. I think what was really fascinating is when the Supreme Court ruling came down that said same-sex marriage is recognized across the country, you saw this very diverse array of responses from the Republican contenders. You saw some like Mike Huckabee or Bobby Jindal who were very hostile and said, you know, we should not listen to what the Supreme Court said. But you saw others like Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio who I think took a much softer approach. And they said, look, you know, I believe what I believe, but the Supreme Court has ruled and let's move forward with sort of tolerance and compassion and open-mindedness. And I thought that was the best possible response. I think, you know, there are way places where a lot of older Republican politicians are gonna hold different views than younger voters. And kind of transparently trying to pander or flip-flop on an issue isn't necessarily something I'd recommend. But where there are differences, I think acknowledging them, but saying, look, I'm open-minded and, and, you know, I think we should be, um, you know, tolerant and compassionate on this issue is the best strategy. And you did see some Republicans taking that path. Are Republicans starting to listen to you? 
and your thinking. I am optimistic. I think after losing young voters so badly in the last two presidential elections, I think a lot of Republicans are realizing that their ability to win a national presidential election based solely on voters who are older, whiter, married, religious, that that's no longer a winning formula. That younger voters, because they're less likely to be um, married or extremely religious or white, um, because all of those trends are sort of coming together at once, Republicans get now that they need to broaden their base. Now, to the extent that any of them are taking real action on that, especially now during the, the Republican primary era, where they're still focused on that Republican primary electorate, remains to be seen. But with this very diverse field, I'm optimistic that at least a couple of them will try a new formula, and I suspect they'll find it met with success. Is one of their problems in winning the primary uh, they win the battle but lose the war. So in some of these primary states, it's certainly the case that younger voters don't turn out as much. Um, you know, that's the case pretty much of any election that's not the main presidential election every four years in November. But that said, young voters still make up between 10 and 15 percent of the primary electorate, even in a Republican primary. And so when you've got so many candidates running and the difference between first and fourth place is likely only going to be a few percentage points, winning over those young voters, particularly because they are so neglected right now and nobody's really talking to them, I think can make a huge difference. And I think there's also a misperception that the Republican primary electorate is so different and so much more conservative than your average voter. If you look at the exit polls from, say, the South Carolina primary in 2012, the Republican primary, only about a third of voters said they were very conservative. The rest said they were somewhat conservative, moderate, or liberal. So I don't think candidates need to make this harsh pivot to the right and then try to pivot back to the middle in the general. I think there's a way to build a broader coalition to talk about why your conservative values actually make sense in terms of policy that will benefit everyone. Um, I think there's a way to do that, to win over hearts in a primary, but have a message that will still resonate in a general. Are they out of step with climate change? Many criticize the Pope's statement. Wouldn't you say most millennials think there is climate change? So the, the data is a little bit unclear. There are some polls that show there's a big generational divide on the issue. But at the same time, millennials are actually less likely to consider themselves environmentalists. They don't really like the politicization of environmental issues. And I think you've seen with some Republicans trying to kind of split the difference with this, I'm not a scientist, uh, you know, point of view. I don't know that that will really succeed longer term. I do think Republicans need to figure out you know, what does a center-right kind of market-based agenda on something like climate look like? And that's not just for young people. I mean, that's, that's for voters across the board. In what is, uh, can be said is generally a moderate country, are there Republican moderates? There are. Um, so as I mentioned before, even in the Republican primary electorate, you have folks that consider themselves moderate. Unfortunately, in both the Republican and Democratic Party, you've seen a little bit of this hollowing out of the sort of moderate middle, particularly when we think about who is representing um, in government in Washington. Um, but there are a lot of folks that, that right now are looking at the parties, and, and they don't know that either party really represents them, particularly in this millennial generation. They're much more likely to be independent. Um, they're much more likely to sort of choose a little from column A and a little from column B. Um, they agree with Republicans on some issues and Democrats on other issues. Um, and that doesn't necessarily make them moderate. It just means they've got a kind of eclectic um, assortment of positions that they hold. How do you view the Bernie Sanders surge? So I think it's fascinating. And I think what's so interesting about it is that he, I think a big part of what's so powerful about him is kind of the authenticity he brings to his message. So, I mean, I don't think Bernie Sanders and I would agree on a whole lot of anything in terms of, you know, economic policy, but I do admire and respect him because it's clear that when he gets up there and gives a speech, he believes what he's saying. And I think that's very refreshing for voters who may look at somebody like Hillary Clinton and feel like so much of what she's saying is very refined and tested and very carefully put together. I think Bernie Sanders is refreshing because he seems authentic. And I think that really tends to resonate, particularly with younger voters who, 
feel like so many politicians nowadays are not very authentic. Um, they're, they're not very in touch um, and they just sort of, you know, say whatever they need to to get by. I, I think that's why you saw Ron Paul four years ago do so well with young people. Um, again, Ron Paul wasn't the hippest, coolest guy on the block, but you didn't doubt that he believed what he was saying. I think that's refreshing, particularly for young people. And I think that's why you're seeing so many people on the left get very excited about Bernie Sanders. But millennials are going to have to go with Hillary if the Republicans don't nominate someone who has some appeal to them, right? Well, they, I mean, they'll be, they could be the stay lesser home. of choices or stay home. They, they could stay home. And I think that's that's a real risk. And, and what concerns me a little bit about my message and trying to get Republicans excited about reaching young people is that I, I constantly will hear back, well, young people don't vote. And I think that if you, you have Hillary Clinton and if she winds up being this really uninspiring candidate in the end, and you have a Republican who gets nominated who's maybe also not inspiring or doesn't want to reach out to young voters, there is a risk that they'll stay home. But remember, this is a huge generation, 75 million people. In the last election alone, even though they had been kind of disappointed with the Obama economy and definitely didn't love Mitt Romney, they still comprised about one out of every five voters. So even if they are disappointed, they will still be a huge factor, particularly in these swing states where the margins might be razor thin. There's a risk, though, for the candidate, the Republican candidate, in trying to look cool when he's not cool or <laughs> she's not cool, right? So I will agree you, with that. <laughs> so if, if you're, they read your book, they're affected by your book, they say this makes a lot of sense, but how do I get it across? So I think it's all about going where young people are. You don't have to be someone you're not. You don't have to pretend to be cool. If you, know, if you don't know what's going on in pop culture and you haven't you know, listened to the top songs on iTunes, you don't have to pretend like you have. But you do need to make sure that you're going places where young people are at. So for instance, President Obama did an interview um, with Zach Galifianakis on his podcast, Between Two Ferns. And actually, the president plays it very straight. He's not trying to be funny. He's not trying to be cool or hip. He just happens to be on a show that, by virtue of the context, is something that young people were watching, found appealing, and found amusing. Um, and he's been very good at that. I mean, he, he does interviews in places like MTV where young people are watching. He's not trying to necessarily be funny. I mean, he saves that for other venues. But you can, you can play it serious, but make sure that you're, you're not neglecting the channels that can be used to reach young people. I think that's an important first step for candidates who may not naturally um, you know, be, be particularly funny or cool themselves. How about your advisors? Now, Hillary has hired a lot of the Obama people who pushed that social media and ran that through. Are the Republicans doing likewise? Are they hiring so, young, young people who are advising them on the way to reach millennials? Like yourself. So some, of, some of the campaigns are, um, but because there are so many Republicans in the field, um, you've already got a small talent pool where, uh, you know, that in and of itself is not as big as the, the talent pool on the Democratic side. And then you're spreading it across over a dozen candidates. So I think it remains to be seen whether um, any of these real frontrunner candidates who have made some hires of folks to do data and digital things will actually give those staffers and advisors a real senior seat at the table and will let, those, let the data drive decisions. Um, I, I've long heard it said, and I, I believe this is true, and I wrote about it in the book, that the problem Republicans have isn't that we don't have the technology or we don't have the data that the Democrats have. It's that we don't have a culture on our side of using it to drive decisions um, and, and prioritizing it in the way that Democrats do. So, there are folks on the right who are, I think, incredibly good at this stuff. And they have been snatched up by a handful of campaigns. But whether they're the ones that get to really be in the driver's seat, making decisions and encouraging folks to run fresh campaigns, that's still an open question. An important book. Thank you, Kristen, very much. Thank you for having me. Kristen Soltis Anderson. The book is The Selfie Vote, Where Millennials Are Leading America and How Republicans Can Keep Up.